And the next item of business is a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions Annual Target Report for 2015. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. But I would ask members, if you wish to speak, to uh, press their buttons now. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, last year when I met with Patricia Espinosa, head of the United Nations climate body, she spoke about Scotland's great achievement on this defining issue. She met the First Minister earlier this month and again congratulated Scotland on its leadership. One point we make when speaking to international figures, and which often surprises them, is the cross-party consensus in Scotland on climate change, and that our 2009 Act was passed unanimously in this chamber. In 2015, Scotland was one of the first countries to sign up to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the overarching framework to tackle poverty and inequality, promote education and health, and grow the global economy sustainably. At the Paris Climate Conference, the First Minister and the German Minister spoke about the Paris Agreement being the first big challenge for the goals. Paris turned out to be a huge achievement. The recent decision by the USA to withdraw has served only to prompt renewed support for the treaty from states, regions, cities and progressively minded businesses. In April, the First Minister signed a cooperation agreement with California Governor Jerry Brown to support his under two coalition. That's almost 200 progressive states and cities covering over 1.2 billion people, 16% of the global population and almost 40% of the global economy. 2018 is going to be a particularly important year for the Paris Agreement. California will host a summit for the under two coalition to help boost global ambition. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, will push, publish its special report on limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And 2018 will also see a major facilitative dialogue to take stock of the collective global effort. We already know more needs to be done. Current Paris pledges could limit global temperature rise to around three degrees, but a wide range of outcomes is possible. It is a crucial time for all countries, ourselves included, to show where they stand. So I'm very pleased to announce that both the First Minister and myself will be attending this year's talks in Bonn in a few weeks' time. This statement sets out the ever stronger messages we will be taking to Bonn. Let me begin with a short formal statement in relation to the statutory Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions Annual Target Report for 2015, which was laid in Parliament this morning. This report shows that Scotland's annual emissions reduction target for 2015 was met, meaning that targets have now been met for the second consecutive year. The report shows that the domestic effort target for 2015 was also met. The report is based on the statistics published in June, which show that Scotland continues to outperform the UK as a whole and to rank very highly internationally. Of the Western European EU 15 countries, only Sweden and Finland have done better to date. Scotland's success in meeting its stretching climate targets is underpinned by a comprehensive package of on-the-ground measures that promote sustainable economic growth and help tackle inequalities whilst decarbonising Scotland's economy. The Scottish Government is currently working to finalise Scotland's climate change plan for publication in February 2018. As part of this process, we are reflecting carefully on all of the recommendations arising from parliamentary scrutiny of the draft plan and the Committee on Climate Change's recent report. The final plan will be strengthened by the bold new low carbon commitment set out in the First Minister's programme for government, exemplified by phasing out the need for new petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2032. Over the past 15 years, we have worked hard to decarbonise our electricity supply and will now direct our renewable energy to electrification on our roads. The programme also commits to doubling investment in active travel, and I'm sure members will be looking forward to discussing this in the debate later this afternoon. We've listened to Parliament and the Committee on Climate Change, and I can confirm that the final plan will include updated sectoral emission envelopes 
reflecting our new commitments as well as the most up-to-date evidence. And we're continuing to work with stakeholders, including the external advisory group, the members of which I would like to thank for their valuable contributions to date, and the Committee on Climate Change as we finalise the plan. The UK government published its clean growth, uh, clean growth strategy earlier this month. The strategy is the statutory counterpart to Scotland's climate change plan in that it sets out the approach to decarbonisation over the period to 2032. However, the UK strategy and our plan diverge in terms uh, of their overall levels of action, reflecting Scotland's more ambitious statutory targets. The strategy is an important document and we are considering it in detail to understand how it impacts on the people of Scotland, our economy and our decarbonisation ambitions. I've already mentioned the important role that independent expert advice plays in the Scottish Government's approach to tackling climate change. I wrote on 12th October to Lord Debon, Chair of the Committee on Climate Change, to thank the Committee for its 2017 progress report. This letter, a copy of which has been laid in Parliament, makes clear that the Scottish Government is reflecting carefully on all of the Committee's recommendations as we work to finalise the climate change plan. Scotland's climate targets under this Parliament's 2009 Act are already the toughest in the UK and amongst the toughest in the world. Unlike the UK Government, the Scottish Government has brought forward proposals for new legislation to raise the ambition of our long-term targets even further in direct response to the Paris Agreement. This reflects our recognition that Paris represents an increase in global ambition and our commitment to keeping Scotland at the forefront of the low carbon transition. Tackling climate change represents not only a moral imperative, but a huge economic opportunity, which we are determined that Scotland should seize. Public consultation on our proposals for a new climate change bill closed on 22nd September. We've received almost 20,000 responses and are now taking time to carefully consider all of these alongside the full range of evidence available. As part of this evidence-based approach, I'm aware that the underpinning scientific guidelines for how we measure greenhouse gas emissions are also continuing to evolve, especially in the land use sectors, which are of particular importance here in Scotland. It is therefore more important than ever that we have access to the most up-to-date information and expert advice. As Parliament has already been informed through my 12th October letter to Lord Debon, I've given the Committee on Climate Change the opportunity to provide any further advice on bill targets that it may consider appropriate at this time. In addition to our climate leadership through domestic action, Scotland plays an active and strengthening international role. I mentioned the under two coalition of high ambition states, regions and cities. I'm delighted that Scotland Cities Alliance has agreed to support the coalition and I look forward to working with our seven cities to promote their progressive position on climate change. Scotland has been an active member of the Climate Group States and Regions Alliance for over a decade. The Alliance brings together some of the most economically powerful regions in the world. We are supporting the Alliance's Futures Fund to help developing countries in the network. Our Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights commits us to continue to champion climate justice. We continue to deliver the First Minister's pledge at Paris to provide at least £3 million each year through our Climate Justice Fund. Following on from over £6 million hydronation funding for water adaptation projects in Africa since 2012, we gave £1 million in 2016 to the UN to support developing countries engaged with the Paris Agreement. Hydronation funding continues with £2.5 million supporting access to water and wastewater services in Malawi. Our new Climate Justice Innovation Fund announced its first £600,000 for six projects in sub-Saharan Africa. We will very soon announce the award of our new Climate Challenge Programme Malawi with £3.2 million over three years. Between 2012 and 2021, our Climate Justice Fund will provide £21 million to some of the world's poorest people. Presiding Officer, climate action lies at the heart of the Scottish Government's aim of creating a successful country through promoting sustainable and equitable economic growth. It is a vital issue which spans ambition, delivery and international partnership working. And I will be proud to relate Scotland's leadership at the forthcoming climate talks in Bonn. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. We'll now move with around 20 minutes for questions. And I'll start with Donald Cameron to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Donald Cameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, advance sight of her statement. It's abundantly clear from yesterday's news of concentrations of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere reaching a record high that we continue to face a major climate challenge. Nevertheless, we must pursue an agenda which sees Scotland meet its commitments and be at the forefront of this worldwide endeavour. And I endorse the Cabinet Secretary's comments in relation to cross-party consensus in Scotland. Having viewed the report, there is a lot to be proud of. However, it is deeply disappointing that in terms of the net Scottish emissions account, emissions have gone up. They've increased by almost 2% in 2015 on the previous year. And we still face the challenge of lowering, lowering carbon levels in a variety of areas. Reflecting on comments made by WWF Scotland that housing is among some of the weakest areas to be dealt with in the draft climate change plan, what action will the Scottish Government take to address that particular area when, when ensuring that Scotland takes a bold approach to reducing emissions? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I thank uh, Donald Cameron for his uh, question. Um, like most countries, I think we would all have to uh, effectively own up to the fact that we continue to emit far more than we actually should. Uh, and uh, it is one of the uh, um, enormous challenges that we all face um, that we uh, get those emissions down as much as possible. Um, Scotland is doing incredibly well, uh, set against uh, other countries, and I'm always surprised to discover that actually it isn't the case that all countries have these clear-cut targets such as we have. So when we are setting ourselves against other uh, countries as example, we're, we're looking at other countries who themselves have set themselves targets, but there are many out there who simply haven't done that. Um, and in those circumstances, measuring our effort against those countries is quite difficult. Um, the member asks about, uh, uh, about housing. He uh, uh, will know that there are very significant challenges in respect uh, of, uh, uh, of housing, not least of which is the uh, existing domestic housing uh, uh, stock. Uh, the challenges uh, that there are to be faced by any government in dealing with the need to ensure that those existing households become uh, more energy efficient is one that we are addressing. We are addressing it as a government through the uh, huge amount of energy efficiency money that is going into, uh, into that work. Uh, but that becomes a challenge uh, as well for, uh, for individuals because those of us who are owner-occupiers uh, have a, a responsibility uh, to look to our own housing to consider whether or not uh, it, it is, uh, uh, it is um, uh, emitting far less than it needs to or should be, um, uh, as well as the requirement that we have to deal with uh, the rented sector and social housing. So there are a number of issues in there uh, that the member is quite right to point to, but which we are looking very carefully at, and I hope he will be content when he sees what is in the final climate change plan in respect of this particular sector. Claudia Beamish to be followed by Graham Dean. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of the statement. In the context of the Paris Agreement, I welcome the Scottish Government commitment to the Climate Justice Fund, giving support to some of the world's poorest people. Climate justice, though, is not just global, but local. The Cabinet Secretary refers in her statement to on-the-ground measures that help tackle inequalities. Can she identify any specific policies which will be actioned here in Scotland to ensure our approach to meeting climate change targets is inclusive, particularly in the sectors progressing most slowly, transport, agriculture and buildings? And can she also perhaps expand on how the shift to the low-carbon economy in the energy sector and other sector, sectors will take into account affected workers and communities through a just transition and possibly something about the commission that um, certainly Scottish Labour is hoping for. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I'll try and uh, cover as many as I can and if I miss any I will uh, uh, undertake to come back to <laughs> Claudia Beamish. Um, I know she cares passionately about these. Um, I think she, in one sense, picks up a little bit from the issue that was raised by Donald Cameron, because one of the big uh, concerns that we all have to ensure that as we move forward in terms of decarbonisation, that there aren't parts of our society uh, that are left behind. But of course, the irony is that as climate change progresses, it's precisely those same uh, poorer sections of society that actually will be the hardest hit. 
Um, so we are addressing a lot of that through uh, a warm homes bill that will be coming up, the energy efficiency uh, measures that we have discussed, and I can advise uh, Claudia Beamish that there is a deal of um, serious conversation uh, exists around that to ensure that nothing we do in terms of uh, uh, um, climate change makes things worse for people uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, fuel poverty particularly, which is a big issue. Um, transport, clearly we uh, um, have made a number of commitments in the, uh, in the um, programme for government and they included commitments around uh, uh, active travel um, and uh, the need to increase the availability of public transport as well as the issues around cars and I appreciate that being able to swap out your petrol or diesel car for an electric vehicle may be a fond hope for many folk who are not able to actually afford uh, a car in the first place. There are huge issues, uh, huge issues uh, around that. Um, but I go back to the point I was making that if we don't make progress in climate change, it is precisely those most disadvantaged sections of society that will be most hit by the advance of climate change. Uh, and we need to try and find the right balance as we move through the various sectors to ensure um, that we don't make that worse, but we also remind people that it will get worse if we don't take the actions we're taking. Graham Deed to be followed by Morris Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the uh, Cabinet Secretary is aware, the EU emissions trading system is the main mechanism to deliver emissions reductions from the traded sector, and it therefore plays a, a key role in supporting our climate change ambitions. Can she advise uh, how our ability to continue in the ETS will be impacted if the UK leaves the EU, and whether she's aware of any work being done by the UK Government to address this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, Graham Day is uh, correct to raise the issue of the um, EU ETS. Um, it is currently the world's largest carbon market, and it doesn't mean that there's a level playing field uh, for businesses across the EU and protects us against carbon leakage, which is a very considerable uh, uh, matter which needs to be addressed. The, the government, therefore, considers that continued participation in the ETS it uh, will be the best for Scotland in the future. It's the most cost-effective means for the traded sector to, decar to decarbonise. Um, and I, I have to say that it, it's a matter of some concern that up until this point, the UK government has been unwilling to discuss future partic participation in the ETS with either myself or other Scottish ministers. Um, and indeed, very recently, the EU itself has now intervened to protect the integrity of the system uh, with the, the scheme, with legislative proposals to prevent the surrender of any new allowances allocated after 1st January 2018 um, to a member state in respect of which there are lapsing obligations. And of course, that means that only one state is in the frame. This could have significant reper repercussions for Scottish businesses imposing additional costs. Um, there's significant market reaction um, and the EU intervention demonstrates the risks of the, EU, uh, of the UK government's approach to the negotiations and the real risk of a disorderly exit, which I'm sure members will agree is a wholly unacceptable situation. I should add, presiding officer, that both myself and Mr Russell have written jointly to the Secretary of State for uh, biz seeking urgent discussions on this very matter. Thank you. Morris Golden to be followed by Emma Harper. Uh, pres presiding officer, we are supportive of the electrification of our roads. This will, of course, bring challenges for the transmission network due to the expansion of electricity demand. Does the Cabinet Secretary support a distribution system operator balancing model at a more local level? Cabinet Secretary. I will do my very best to establish what that actually means and I will get back to <laughs> Maurice Golden. Uh, he uh, is allowing his inner geek to come forward in this um, and it's a, um, a, a splendid answer, a, 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 a splendid example of a question that uh, perhaps means he couldn't think of a better one to ask. Emma Harper to be followed by David Stewart. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how Scotland is showing its strong support for the Paris Agreement? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, uh, obviously I've indicated in my statement already how important we regarded Paris and how uh, uh, much um, that particular year's climate change talks were important to the government. Our, 
Our proposals for a new climate change bill do represent a very direct statutory response to the aims of the Paris Agreement. And I go back to what I said, this is not actually normal. Um, many countries aren't doing it this way. The Committee on Climate Change advises that increasing the 2050 target to a 90% reduction would be aligned to the Paris aim of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 centigrade. Um, our proposals will also enable the setting of a further target for net zero emissions as soon as the appropriate date to do so can be determined in an evidence-based manner. This will support the Paris aim of reaching global net zero emissions during the second half of the century. And other bodies in Scotland uh, have also been showing support for the Paris Agreement. Um, all three key architects of the agreement, French Minister Laurent Fabius, uh, um, Cristiano Figueres, the former head of the UNFCCC, and president of COP20, Manuel uh, Pulgar Vidal, have all visited Scotland and received the Royal Scottish Geographical Society Shackleton Medal for their joint efforts. And all three are well aware how committed this country is uh, to the Paris Agreement. David Stewart, to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. <coughs> Uh, thank you, President Officer. I welcome the statement from the Cabinet Secretary. As Scotland, of course, is one of the first countries to debate domestic climate legislation for, following the ratification of the Paris Agreement. Uh, President Officer, when days of a new Labour-led government in New Zealand, vigorous and dynamic new agricultural climate change targets were set, what can the Cabinet Secretary learn from New Zealand and best practice across the world? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm aware that uh, New Zealand, under its new government, has uh, begun to make some significant moves uh, on climate change. Um, uh, I have to say that the 2015 stats in Scotland show that agriculture emissions are down by more than 25% from baseline levels. So we have been doing uh, a considerable amount of work uh, ourselves. Uh, I will look very closely um, at any other countries. Uh, particular interest in sectors that look like they will be analogous uh, to Scotland's for uh, consideration. However, I would gently caution the member um, that once one looks very closely at some other countries' proposals, it sometimes transpires that they're not quite what they have appeared on the surface. And uh, um, that uh, uh, means that we are often not comparing uh, apples with apples, but apples with pears, if I can use a horticultural expression. Uh, it is something that one has to be rather careful of uh, and is one which, for example, uh, relates to the comparisons that we often make ourselves with us and Sweden, when in actual fact we're not both doing the same thing uh, in terms of getting to where we want to go. Yes, Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary aware that on the 21st September Nicaragua signed up for the Paris Agreement, leaving therefore only two countries in the world not signatories, Syria and the United States? Will the uh, government uh, use the uh, climate group states and regions approach to work with the states in the United States to mitigate the anti-science effects of the presidency and far too many of the government's administrators. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think uh, I perhaps saw the same tweet that the member um, uh, may have picked that particular information up about Nicaragua. Um, uh, I think for all of us, we would have preferred the United States not to have taken the position that it is taken on uh, Paris. Um, and it's a matter of uh, some regret that it has chosen uh, to do that. Um, we work very closely uh, with the um, climate group. It's an important uh, forum uh, for this country. Uh, and the member will be grateful to know that uh, when I visit Bonn in a couple of weeks' time, I will be attending a number of uh, um, uh, roundtable discussions with other members in that group, particularly with... Uh, um, for example, California, though it's been of uh, uh, interest to us. Um, and those, uh, those conversations will continue. And I perhaps should have said that uh, uh, to the previous member that I will take every opportunity when I'm in Bonn to see whether or not uh, there are uh, useful discussions, not just across the climate group, but with others who might be there. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Thank you. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advanced copy of this very positive statement? But our ability to cut carbon in the future is partly dependent on the spending decisions of Derek Mackay today. 
Investment in reopened railways, green bus funds, and home energy efficiency are just some of the infrastructure priorities needed to cut carbon, improve economic efficiency, tackle exclusion, and even tackle air pollution. So how will the Scottish Government budget prioritise investment that will cut emissions rather than simply locking them in for generations to come? Well, I'm not in a position to be able to preempt the budget or any statements that my colleague Derek Mackay uh, may make in the coming weeks uh, and months. I think the member will have seen from the programme for government the doubling of the active travel budget. Um, so he must, I presume, uh, have welcomed that. I, uh, I think the Green Bus Fund is being extended as well. So these are particular issues raised uh, in his question where... Uh, I would have expected he would have been happy to know uh, that uh, uh, increased support was being given. Um, the programme for government was widely hailed as being, uh, I think the phrase used was, uh, amongst the greenest uh, government uh, uh, programmes for government ever. Um, and uh, uh, while that is a piece of hyperbole that I may want to repeat often, I think it is one that people should reflect upon uh, and uh, I hope that they will welcome everything that is there um, and including through the budget process, which we are about to embark upon. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I too uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of what's a generally upbeat uh, statement and echo her comments around the uh, cross-party support in this Parliament. In light, though, of comments from uh, Scottish Renewables today of what they call the first decline in renewable heat output that Scotland has seen since measurement began in 2008-09, uh, can she inform Parliament of what additional measures the government uh, will bring forward or is contemplating in the final uh, climate change plan that will help deliver uh, more renewable heat in Scotland so that we can indeed meet our renewable energy targets? Yeah, uh, can I thank Liam for his question? I, I should remind him that I said that the final plan will be published in February 2018 and uh, he will uh, forgive me if I um, uh, uh, operate on the basis that uh, uh, um, uh, stating in advance what's going to be in it is not uh, in keeping with uh, the publication date of uh, February 2018. I mean, I think Scotland's, uh, Scotland's uh, record on renewables has been uh, um, uh, pretty extraordinary. Um, we're sometimes having difficulty because of decisions that are taken elsewhere, uh, which do not help us. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I continue to be as upbeat as I possibly can be uh, in the circumstances. Uh, and I think we will continue uh, um, insofar as we are able to do uh, to make further advances on this particular area, which, as I indicate, has been one of the success stories uh, of Scotland in terms of climate change. We've got three more questions, if we can squeeze them in. Uh, Fulton McGregor to be followed by John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. Um, even, even although this ambitious uh, um, approach, as outlined by the Cabinet Secretary, um, in terms of reducing emissions, we, will, we aren't going to be immune to the experience and the effects of climate change as will be faced over the world. What progress is the Scottish Government making on climate change adaptation specifically? Well, well the member's right to raise the, the, the point that there are two um, sides to dealing with climate change. One is mitigation, which tends to get most of the coverage. The other is adaptation, of course. Um, uh, uh, which uh, tends to be less often uh, discussed. But the Paris Agreement does make it clear that, the, uh, that climate change adaptation is enormously important. A number of important reports are around Scotland's progress in this area have been produced in the past year or so, um, including the independent assessment of the current Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme and the Climate Change Risk Assessment. Um, there was a meeting in Stirling last week between uh, my officials and uh, a range of stakeholders to begin consideration of the next adaptation programme, uh, which is due in 2019. And we've recently launched our new, center, uh, new national centre for resilience, uh, a national coastal change assessment, and new adaptation indicators. The so collaborative partnerships uh, uh, approaches to adaptation are also emerging in a variety of different local areas, including Climate Ready, Clyde Edinburgh Adapts and Aberdeen Adapts. So there is a considerable amount of work on the ground, which is where adaptation efforts uh, need to take place. But the member is right to raise that as an issue because most of the focus tends to be on mitigation. And we mustn't forget that adaptation is becoming ever more important. John Scott. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the CLEAR Committee this morning, evidence was taken on air quality management areas and low emission zones. However, evidence given to the committee during our inquiries raises concerns about the funding available to deliver better air quality. Given that the transport emissions mitigation budget has been cut from 179.8 million to 153 million, can the Cabinet Secretary assure Parliament that sufficient funding will be made available to Transport Scotland, local authorities, SEPA and others to implement successfully the Scottish Government's good intentions on air quality? Cabinet Secretary. I thank John Scott for his question. I uh, looked with some query at the Transport Minister who isn't... Uh, uh, immediately understanding where the member's information comes from. So uh, um, we will undertake to have a, a check of that. However, um, I ought to point out what I said uh, earlier about the budget uh, discussions which are uh, about to be undertaken. Um, low emission zones are part of the programme for government. We are committed now to one by the end of 2018 roll out to the other major cities uh, um, as soon after as that is possible um, and, uh, uh, and then in all those air quality management areas where it is considered necessary. So we are now in a process where uh, the negotiations around the funding of those uh, is becoming active. I had a meeting uh, last week uh, with uh, officials from one particular council and it was of course uh, an issue that they wanted to explore. Um, it's not a secret that Glasgow is the preferred first low emission zone. Those discussions are also active um, uh, and the uh, low emission zones will be funded appropriately as and when they are rolled out. Angus MacDonald. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware uh, that the Green Bus Fund has been of enormous benefit to bus operators throughout Scotland and of course the Falkirk District where Alexander Dennis has they secured multiple orders for their world-class hybrid Enviro buses through the fund. Given the success of the Green Bus Fund in Scotland, will the Cabinet Secretary and the Transport Minister uh, consider altering the fund to ensure it also provides for bus retrofits at the proposed engine re retrofitting centre, which would clearly assist greatly in future emissions reductions, not just for LEZs, but for towns and villages countrywide? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I understand it, the Transport Minister is in discussion with bus companies about this very issue. Um, so uh, I hope the member will uh, liaise with the Transport Minister as that discussion uh, progresses. The Green Bus Fund has been very helpful in accelerating the uptake of low emission buses into our bus fleet. Um, and that obviously has benefits for air quality and climate change. And we've been uh, very committed to that. It is being extended um, and uh, uh, we're uh, really um, looking uh, forward to that, uh, that progress. The Bus Service Operators Grant Low Carbon Incentive, uh, along with the Green Bus Fund, has helped to bring approaching 500 green buses into the Scottish fleet. I think by any measure, uh, that is a really good figure. I thank the Minister and members. That concludes our statement. And we'll now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate in the name of Hamza Youssef. Just take a few seconds to change seats.